Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Behaviour Change in FMCG, What Will Stick? Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You've joined the presentation listening using your computer speaker system by default. If you'd prefer to join over the telephone, just select the telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You'll have the opportunity to, sub to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We'll collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. The recording and slides will be available for download after the webinar. It is now my pleasure to introduce your first speaker, Lenica Shields, Global Insight Director. Thanks, Chloe, our wonderful counterpart at GoToWebinar. And um, first and foremost, obviously, um, good morning to all of you across Europe joining in on our behavior change webinar on shocks and shifts and what sticks. On behalf of my colleague, Miriam Martin, Commercial Director in the Nordics, Mark Noof, Global Director Retail, and of course myself, um, we are really quite pleased to be able to share with you today our latest findings on these longer standing shifts and more recent shocks that our shoppers have been experiencing in the realm of FMCG. Uh, and it is at GFK, since we are a data-driven insights company, that we really take growth from knowledge quite seriously at the heart of our operation. And we capture behavioral data continuously via our uh, household purchasing panel. Um, at the same time also, uh, of course it is true that whatever we buy and ends up in our basket in the end, is the ultimate measure of consumer demand, but it also is sometimes somewhat of a lagging indicator of the underlying and very complex uh, consumer wants and needs. So what we try to do here is to really carefully construct a 3D layered picture of what will drive consumers ahead in the future uh, in order to provide you even with the tiniest bit of, uh, of foresight today. Uh, and in the context of behavior change to do so, we have really interviewed um, main shoppers in seven core countries in Europe about their behavioral changes in the past year. And even more so, uh, we've taken a deep dive into what their expectations are towards the future to really be able to predict what will stick on both the constants of change and the lasting shocks. And on top of that, we really add our key purchasing KPIs from across all of our 17 uh, European consumer panel markets to really further contextualize these insights for you. Um, and together we cover more than 200 million households in doing so. So first let's look a bit at what the economic climate is at the moment. And Quite positively, positively, I can add that in uh, our latest round in May uh, of just uh, the past month, we really see that the consumer climate in Europe is really picking up and it's almost nearing the levels of the pre-COVID situation. However, at the other hand, we also know that still over half of Europeans are still either affected directly uh, economically by the crisis, either because they have lost their job or because they can hardly make ends meet, or they're concerned that this will happen on the short term. So there's still quite some uncertainty in the air. Nevertheless, if we look ahead at what our expectations are for growth, we would really uh, assume that about a third of the lockdown growth will, ex uh, will actually stick. Uh, beyond uh, the lockdowns. If you look at the first lockdowns, um, FMCG value growth really averaged somewhere between 8 and 12 percent and with partial lockdowns it's dropped to a little bit over half of it. And as stated, our expectations is that about a third of this will actually stick uh, beyond the current situation. If we look at the difference between Western Europe and Eastern Europe, there's actually a quite some difference, whereas in Western Europe the shock has been lived a little bit more intensely and also the rise in uh, FMCG growth was, uh, was quite higher. 
in Eastern Europe, we see lots of inflation driven uh, growth throughout the years, and this will maintain so for the next few years to come. So in order to captivate some of this 4% growth that we together expect to see, we of course need to understand what behaviors will stick and that's what this webinar is all about, right? So if we think behavior change, obviously change is a constant. I'll give you that because it's it's been around for <laughs> as long as we exist. But I hope you would also agree with me that these macro forces that have been um, pulling and pushing on our shoppers have really created such a different constellation altogether last year that it's really safe to say that um, our trusted routines have really changed and very likely so will change uh, or will keep the way uh, for some time to come. And when we look a little bit deeper into this new constellation, we really see five major drivers for change. And this really starts with the, the, the shock effect shoppers experience in sense of how they had to shop and where and at what pace, which really meant that the touch points we had usually with our shoppers really were put under lots of pressure. At the same time, it also offered loads of opportunity as new occasions arose from shoppers being forced to rethink the home as life's hub. Uh, but it also added great deals of stress upon households, which in turn has led many of us to rethink uh, our health and well-being in a more mindful way. And surely the crisis has evidenced that it is uh, quite vital that a society is, is healthy in order to function. It has also furthered our consciousness about the effects of climate change and the, the social gaps we see widening uh, in these times. And as a testimony to that, we also see many shoppers wanting to change their own behaviors, um, really using their purchasing power for good. And they also are looking actively for brands that kind of mirror that intention as well. And then at the other end of the spectrum, of course, the, the economic uncertainty that we were living is really uh, adding an edge to the fact that we continuously juggle cost and added value and these rising needs and changing needs, we need to fulfill them, but of course, without having to overspend. So in the next hour or so, we'd really like to take you through each of these five points and really kind of see together and, and, and try to understand and predict somehow what kind of underlying um, behaviors will really stick. Because over one in four Europeans has actually really strongly changed their behavior last year when it comes to their daily behaviors in terms of grocery shopping, their health, well-being, their home situation, work situation, how they prepare meals, etc. And when we look at each of these five drivers, which we've entitled balance, budgeting, purpose, findability, and fluidity, we see that this also holds true within each of these areas. So, of course, with some degree of variation, we see that anywhere between one in four or one in three uh, shoppers has really lived strong change in these areas with balance, health, and well-being being uh, the leading uh, force for change in this sense that it sees the most shoppers saying they have really uh, adapted their behaviors accordingly. And there's also some degree of variation between the countries. When we look at Italy, we see almost one in two shoppers actually stating that they have really strongly uh, lived a behavior change, which is as expected given the, the harshness of the situation in Italy. And at the other end, we see Russia where the, the strength of behavior change is felt less urgently, let's say. And before we deep dive into each of these five topics, it maybe makes sense to just step back a bit and understand that these five forces do have a different impact on behavior change. Because even though balance sees the greatest number of shoppers that says that to have lived a true behavior change, it's not really felt as a shock effect. This shock effect is much more felt in areas of fluidity, which has everything to do with the new occasions and the new way of fluid living we had to 
find because we are living more inside our homes than ever. Uh, and in the area of findability on how we shop and where we shop. And this is quite understandably, of course, because these were most heavily influenced by the lockdown rules and were really causing a true shock. Whereas the other three forces are really felt as an acceleration. And of course, they have been reshaped throughout the crisis to gather somehow also a little bit of a different meaning throughout uh, the past year. And if we look towards our expectations for next year, and this is, I think, one of the main things we want to achieve here, is to really see that these th final three drivers, so purpose, balance, and budgeteering, they have been accelerated, changed somewhat in direction, but these are exactly the ones that will keep continue to grow quite uh, heavily uh, in the next year. But also the shock behaviors that really were only caused by this lockdown rules that were forced upon us, we will see that quite a few of those underlying behaviors are actually also here to stay. And this is a little bit less true for fluidity because people are really looking forward to well, flee out of their homes, let's say, than it is in the area of findability where we actually see uh, still the, the, the new routines or the new inertia that's created, that this will continue, continue to grow slightly. And this is the first of the topics we'll deep dive into uh, today, which uh, my colleague Mark will take. But before we do so, I'd like to just ask you a little poll. Um, so if you would be so kind to, to think with us a bit on, on what is your revenue expectation actually for your own category, uh, and let's just confine it to the in-home market for the next 12 months. Do you expect a sharp decline, a steady development, or actually a sharp uh, increase? Can we see some of the answers coming in already? Okay, so that's quite an interesting image we see here, which says 60% expects a steady development and furthermore, a little bit more expect a increase, but also, and this is, uh, also quite something we need to take into account, obviously, 17% of you actually expect a decline in the next year. So really interesting to see as well how our driving forces for change will affect each and every one of your categories. And I will now hand over to Mark for the first topic of findability. Thank you, Lenneke. Um, so I hope you can hear me already. Um, we will now deep dive into the driver of findability. So the COVID-19 crisis had led to a strong reduction of touch points. The shoppers were trying last year to visit as little place, shopping places as possible, and they tried to spend as little time in stores as possible. Some of them are even uh, were not shopping at all in stores any longer and did their shopping online. This depression of in-store FaceTime means that findability is key to success of manufacturers and retailers. Now I click twice, sorry for that one. So what kind of behaviors has been established in 2020 and 2021? Six out of 10 shoppers in Europe said that they made a shopping list. 27% of them said that they made use of new Insta technologies. And one sixth of them said that they bought in specialized online stores and that they did their main groceries online. But what was driving really the behavior change in the area of findability? 
um, in a driver analysis, we found out that the most important driver uh, is that people tried to shop as fast as possible. And also COVID the COVID-19 crisis made it um, needed that we buy some different products or we were interested in buying different products that maybe boosted our mood. To find these special products, we often, um, we often bought online at specialized shops. And what will stick in 2022? To find out what people are really interested in 2022, we asked them what they expect to do in the next 12 months. And to analyze this new behavior, we, um, we introduced a new KPI, which we called the net expectation share. The net expectation share is the share of shoppers or, or the difference between uh, the share of shoppers that expect to do this more or a lot more and the share of shoppers who expected to do less or much less. And what we can see is that the net expectation is the strongest or has the, the highest uh, positive share for make use of new technologies, make a shopping list or buy different products than usual. Which is quite interesting It is that those statements that are in the area of online shopping, that they have a negative expectation. So this might um, be seen as uh, so that shoppers are interested to buy again in store and that they are longing for an interesting shopping behavior in store and do not want to shop online any longer. That the touch points are really under major pressure can be seen or can be shown that we have lost 3.4 billion shopping trips in the MRTQ1 2021 in comparison to previous year. So every household in Europe has bought 17 times less in a year. And this is especially a problem, problem for new products. For them, roaming the shelves is one key element for discovery of these new products. If people are buying less in store and if they have uh, if they are hurrying in a in the store and uh, only follow your sh their shopping lists it's a problem for the new products because they might not be um, discovered so it's a threat for the product adoption as we all know we had a strong e-commerce growth in the MRTQ1 2021 um, in respect to the previous year. So we had uh, overall uh, across our 17 GFK consumer panel countries in Europe an increase of the value of 71%. Now 69 million European shoppers buy online, which is an average, average of 34% of shoppers across the countries. In Sweden, even more than every second, per, uh, every second household is buying online. And as you can see on the right side, the share of e-commerce jumped from January 2020 to February 2021 from 4.3% to 7.1%. But we also see that with the easing lockdown regimes, we, we stall growth at a new plateau. So there is no more demand from the shoppers to buy online. But the e-commerce growth has alerted venture capital. We already see several unicorns in the area of e-commerce business. By now, they have a very small market share but they have a very high market capitalization. 
So maybe the next push for e-commerce is not coming from the demand side, but coming from the supply side. These companies have a lot of money to, uh, to um, strengthen their findability in the market. But on the other hand, they are all, or several of them at least, or most of them at least, are logistics specialists. They are the modern milkmen, or they stand for instant delivery. They have to show if they can um, also have the wow effect for the sensorial needs of the shoppers. Okay, as Lenica said, we have seen in the area of findability a real shock. So the, the lockdown um, rules reduce the, the touch points uh, strongly. So it was a real shock. But of course, this is easing um, now in 2021. But still, there are some watchouts for manufacturers and retailers. So first, stand out. In-store touch points are under great pressure still. There is, so make sure your assortment heroes are easy to spot and maximize your shelf space. Invest in second placements and activation for your products. Second, prime pre-store. Invest more uh, of your communication budget to drive to store marketing. Priming your brand in shoppers' minds is ever more relevant in times of touch point depression. Focus on your strongest brand assets with context sensitive creativity. And third, surprise, online, shoppers hardly look beyond the first new res few results. Occasion-based secondary placement is vital to increase findability and discovery. Rethink the sensorial wow effect in virtual buying. Now I hand over to my colleague Miriam. Hi, thank you, Mark. Um, I want to uh, take us through the second uh, uh, behavior that is more of a shock change um, in the behavior that we've seen. It's fluid fluidity. With more and more time uh, being spent at home, also for working, we have not clear separation between work and home anymore. So space and time became more fluent. Home functioned as an office, a school, a store, restaurant, um, anything actually. And, um, and this is really where new occasions we see coming up at home really demand more flexible uh, solutions. Uh, in the behavior that we've seen established uh, um, over the last uh, yeah, months and, and year, is it really more taking, care, taking place at home, more meals, um, working from home and so on. But we also see that impacting um, more snacking, actually, uh, interestingly, um, often for good mood boost. And, uh, and also it made more home to deliveries, um, uh, safety reasons, um, not being able to, you know, want it good to go out into the stores um, as well and having them more of a restaurant um, experience at home, maybe. But we also saw, interestingly, really shopping behaviors change. So the different time, people shopped at different times than before, shopped at different stores. And in 9% of cases was even different a person of the household that did the shopping. And uh, um, here, next slide. And this is really what actually changed the, um, the behavior more traditionally, which the shock to the behavior. Oops, sorry, let's go back. Um, so at different times, shopping at different times, shopping at different stores, but also using more takeaway and delivery. That's really what, what created the shock in the changes in the behavior. Uh, so and we, for example, here in uh, in the Netherlands, we see that uh, home delivery is actually increased by 37% from beginning of last year to beginning of this year. On the other side of the slide, we see that snacking with, across Europe increased substantially when it comes to salty snacks, about 6% of household spend and chocolate, about an additional 4% of household spend. So really boosting uh, one's mood um, is, is been top of mind over the crisis. But what will stick? 
Now we're going to start from the bottom of this uh, graphic, actually. So snacking was more and more, uh, we see before, uh, it was, was increasing over the period of the crisis, but going forward, the substantial amount uh, of people wants to reduce the snacking um, you know, compared to, to now. Um, and in the middle of this uh, graphic, we see that you know, the home uh, consumption or eating at home, working from home is also planned to reduce it. People are really eager to get out uh, of the house and be more social. But what will really stick is the top two. Uh, spending uh, shopping at different times of uh, the day of the of the week and sp so sh spending shopping sorry shopping in different uh, stores is what really will stick around. And that also changes what people shop. We can see that category frequency is actually increasing, but brand loyalty is actually declining, and that means that um, people are trying new things, trying new brands, trying new products have a bit more diversity at home. And this we also see with, on the right-hand side, more numbers of categories being bought, which equals also more diversity in the products that you find at home. On the other hand, we see that less retailers are visited, which we can link, of course, also to um, an increase in one-stop shopping and um, wanting to reduce the risk of, of uh, exposure by going to less stores. So what does it mean for manufacturers and retailers? It really means that the changing and shopping routines will stick. And this means, for example, um, that the big basket is shopped more often during the weekday than uh, on the weekends like it was before. And this requires manufacturers and retailers to change, uh, to adjust uh, the activation plans accordingly. New occasions at home means also uh, products being used in new, um, new different ways and new, new occasions. And this needs to be taken into consideration as well when launching and uh, communicating advertising products. And last but not least, as we've seen more different shoppers and um, more diff shopping at more different stores also means that uh, new to the category buyers actually have to be attracted to the category and continuously recruited. Um, and this is especially important for non-category leaders because uh, new category buyers tend to be more um, um, light users that often prefer the, um, the leading brand. Our next, um, the next trend is balance. And balance, like uh, Lenica said before, is uh, shown the uh, with 35% shown the uh, biggest change in um, in behavior, but it's seen more as an acceleration rather than a shock. It's all about holistic health, body and mind. It's a need to slow down, to take control. It's a uh, moderation and self-care. It's more products uh, that are natural and healthy. And it's all about um, renovating of oneself after the post-COVID situation. Um, and we see this here, and one in two people actually are paying attention to their physical health or mental well-being. But we also see 43% actually uh, trying to moderate so-called bad food and drinks, thinking alcohol and chocolate. Um, and uh, at the end, we also see uh, the lower on the lower lines, we also see additional self-care in the forms of using vitamins and supplements, but also 29% using food specifically to improve the mood, talking chocolate again. So it's about uh, products with a purpose um, as well. And this is really what actually is shaking this trend of behavior. Food to improve my mood, food as a therapy, in addition to special attention to mental well-being. And as we all know, chocolate has also a positive impact on, on the mental well-being to some degree. Um, but going forward, what does that mean? Going forward, like we've seen also before and the snacking decreasing, we see that people want to spend less, drink less, eat and drink less food uh, to improve their moods and really focus more on physical and, and mental well-being as we see already on a high level but increasing continuously. It's all about taking good care of oneself. And how do the people plan to do that? 55% say they want to lose weight. We see that like, I think the average increase in calorie in, in, in kilos was nine percent uh, nine kilos uh, on average over the period of the crisis. 
but they also plan to take up sports, do more yoga, eat less meat, and drink less alcohol. And we see that also reflecting in the increases of alternative categories. It's all about doing mindful choices. On the left-hand side, you see that more and more people are uh, entering the category of non-alcoholic beers with a penetration increase of uh, 7% across Europe. And on the right-hand side, we see that uh, the share of household spend, share of wallet uh, on organic food has been increasing as well um, across Europe. As a manufacturer and retailer, you can support this trend of self-care with helping to make uh, conscious decisions with alternatives to um, healthier choices, to treating yourself, and also maybe to cheating a little bit on, on uh, keeping the chocolate in, in the mind as well, of course, for conscious decisions. And you can do that by informing, uh, providing information on the pack, by facilitating the better choices and self-care. It's really important to keep in mind that this um, holistic health ideal is really ageless. It's across generations. And this gives the manufacturers a, a, uh, an opportunity to uh, really communicate on how their products are helping to support the renovation of self. Now we would like to know from you, in your opinion, which category will shop, um, will shoppers turn to most for the quest of holistic health? Is it self-care over the counter? Is it beauty, fresh food, fitness supplements, or dietary products, for example? Is it going to be? We see results already. Fresh food, yes. Um, that is something really also striking in a lot of our countries that we see. Fresh food has increased a lot. But also interesting to say self care and over the counter being really, um, really high um, as a number two. Danica, any thoughts to this? Well, so far, I find it quite interesting to see that, um, for example, fitness supplements and dietary products are actually expected um, very much less so. so that we see that it's the, the more functional products are not really uh, considered yet as like really a catalyst for growth. And it's rather the look for the, the, the search for real fresh naturalness uh, as well yeah. naturalness but also mm -hmm. um and this is something we have been seeing uh, earlier as well this need for prevention um and i think that and and the need to add vitamins and add like um healthy ingredients and nutrients to your food i think that combination of fresh fresh foods with at the other hand uh supplementing your diet with this like self-care um and i fresh should say, also be Sorry. <laughs> what? And fresh food also being con connected with local food that will you talk about later a little bit in another of the trends. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yes. So really, interesting. really interesting. Yes. Thanks for sharing, everyone. So I hand over to Mark again. Thank you. <clears throat> so we are coming to a, another accelerating trend, which is budgeteering. So the years ahead will be marked by the need for budget engineering, understood as balancing budget, lifestyle demands, and perceived quality. A large number of Europeans expect economic hardship while we are at the onset of a serious price inflation. This will surely influence price sensitivity. On the one hand, shoppers will choose to trade down for purely functional products. But on the other hand, they will pay a premium when their lifestyle needs and values are reflected.
So a lot of people or a lot of shoppers are really hit by the COVID crisis and are affected by the crisis uh, in, a, in an economical way. Therefore, a lot of shoppers have to check on prices of grocery products when they intend to buy and also on promotions. But on the other hand, they still pay special attention to the quality of the products. So 66% of all shoppers said that they checked the prices of the grocery products they intended to buy. 52% tried to shop in stores with the best promotions. On the other hand, quality perception is really important. 63% of them paid special attention to the quality of the products. Interestingly, these promotion price and quality topics are not those who have driven the behavior change in the area of budgeteering. The main driver was that people look for products with a special benefit for themselves and that they plurged on premium. The My third driver... Really... Oh, sorry. sorry. Mark, really interesting here on looking on the products with a special benefit. Um, which reminds me of really um, having a more needs-focused uh, um, approach, especially also with secondary placement and stores. Um, I, I saw a lot of integration across categories, and one example I come to mind is really like an energy station where you collab, you know, aggregate all the products that energy is actually, and this could be from a banana to nuts, chocolate, water, uh, colas, and energy drinks, of course. So really cross-category placements and store. Yeah. Good example. The last driver is that people buy less often and therefore the spend per trip is going up and therefore they, they really have a look at uh, a quite low amount of their total basket. So, and what will be the drivers of the behavior of budgeteering in 2022? You can see, of course, that the, the price and promotion topics are still important, but the main drivers are that people are still pay attention to the quality of the products and that they have a, a look for products with a special benefit for them. This growth path uh, differed between the Western European countries and the Eastern European countries. As you can see on the average of our consumer panels across Europe, that private labels and hard discounters were growing uh, over proportionally uh, in respect to FMCG total. On the other hand, you can see that private label growth and hard discounter growth were under proportionally in most of the Western European countries. And therefore you can see, of course, that it has to do something with if people are economically affected by the COVID-19 crisis or not. Those who are affected look more often to private label alternatives and take more care about a, a, a low total basket. And they also check more on prices. On the other hand, they do not do it at the expense of expectation on value add. So we again see that quality is very important in 2022. Okay, let's summarize uh, the needs in the area of budgeteering. First, communicate benefits. Despite the budget pressure, shoppers are willing to pay a premium for product that reflects their needs. So be sure to communicate benefits rather than the functional aspects. Second, facilitate budget engineered shopping. So reassess category management to reflect the need for budget engineering, uh, engineering engineered shopping. Functional brands on the one hand side and value add brands on the other hand, uh, hand have to be balanced. The total basket side will be under 
scrutiny, be sure to stimulate the big trips with maintaining basket profitability. And the third one is value adds private labels and hard discount offerings. So hard discounters face really a challenge from our perspective as value add or added value is not a strong uh, association is increasing the availability of value add propositions is a must for discounters to attract shoppers in times of one-stop shopping. So thank you. And I hand over again to Lenneke. Yes, thanks, Mark. And last but not least, I would really like to talk to you about shoppers actively seeking brands with purpose. As we have learned that choice hierarchy is somehow less defined by price alone, but even more so by added value, as Mark just uh, reflected upon. And especially shoppers are increasing looking for brands and products that really smoothly are able to combine lifestyle demands with business for good. And if we look at some of the key behaviors in this area, um, we actually see that it is, oh, I clicked too fast, um, switching to local, locally produced products that is uh, one of the most commonly and most established behavior at this moment, uh, and buying brands that take care about animal welfare and buying brands that take care about the environment are the top three behaviors. And it is certainly true that uh, many of these behaviors don't seem to have as much reach yet am among European shoppers as many of the other behaviors that we have seen earlier on in this webinar do. But it is especially the expected change and the direction of that change that makes this force really want to watch. Because if we look up on past year, already 30% of Europeans really say that they have further altered their behavior towards buying more sustainably uh, or more equitably. And this is really and really represents a true progressive shift. And if we then think about or analyze rather what has been really driving change in this area, the number one driver of behavioral change when it comes to purposeful purchasing has been the added effort to really buy um, environmentally friendly brands. Um, also, we see lots more shoppers turning uh, to brands that really promote social equality. And interestingly, uh, when we analyze a little bit further, this is even more so for those that have been affected by the crisis or are concerned about the economic effects themselves. Um, and in the second place, what I also think is worth mentioning here is we further see evidence of the increasing and sometimes difficult tension here between uh, the intentions to act in a purposeful way in this area and actually the ability or the know-how to do so. Because a second driver of change has been the, the need to look to others for inspiration on how to actually make that difference. So surely we see intentions rising and this is invariably so if we look at all of our uh, key behaviors in the area, especially the top three behaviors will really strongly increase further uh, in the next year. But it's not only intentions that are rising, it's also actually the activism that keeps growing. If, uh, and now I'm quoting from our uh, latest findings from our Who Cares Who Does study, which is an uh, annual sustainability study we conduct together with our partners Europanel and Kantar. Uh, in this study, we have found that one in four Europeans already really qualifies as a eco-active, meaning they truly strongly care about the big environmental issues being climate waste and plastic uh, waste, uh, climate change and plastic waste in uh, mainly in Europe. Uh, but at the other hand, they also really take prompt actions to reduce their own uh, waste and footprint. And if we look, for example, to Germany, we see already as much as 38% of shoppers are these days eco-activists. So Germany is really leading the way here. And we could say easily the market is two or three years ahead of the rest. And then it's quite surprising that when we see that intentions and actions are rising that much, 
only 19% at this point can actually name a brand that they consider to act in an environmentally friendly way. And even more so, only 25% actually trust companies about the claims that they make uh, concerning their environmental practices. So one of the major things that needs to be solved in this area is the huge trust gap that uh, seem to exist. Uh, because it is actually the manufacturers that we all expect to solve the problems uh, when it comes to the environment, even more so than governments or retailers or the shoppers themselves, but you don't quite seem to trust uh, their communications about it and their efforts in this area. So there's a little bit of a contradiction going on here. But the fact that eco-activism will in keep increasing is very much true and it doesn't only hold true for Europe, it's a global phenomenon. If we look at the growth rates uh, that we see in our global data, in 2020 already 20% 20 across the globe were eco-activist, up from 16% only a year earlier. So it is also really true that the, the, the crisis has really acted as a catalyst. And if we assume the same growth rates for the next few years, we'll see uh, this already doubling by 2025, up to 40% of global population. And together, this segment of eco-actives represent more than 700 billion euros in FMCG spend. So even if the green imperative would not be convincing enough, the business imperative surely will be. And it's also quite resistant to economic uncertainty, because if we again take our crisis types as an example, you see that this willingness and need to find eco-friendly alternatives is equally strong amongst all three groups. And here in the end, it really pays off to deep dive into the German market a bit. As I said, German markets really leading the way here, so we can kind of use it as a prediction of what might happen elsewhere as well. And our German team has been classifying all brands according to a hierarchy of needs with product or more functional brands um, in the bottom of the needs period, mainly catering to the traditional strengths like quality and shopper trust. Then the more hybrid brands that really uh, have an additional benefit for shoppers and sometimes an initial focus on sustainability. And then at the top end, we have purpose lifestyle brands and sustainable brands. Purpose brands are really the ones that are able to combine both the really strong shopper lifestyle demands with a really strong focus on sustainability. And this focus here is really uh, one of the major satisfiers, but not the only satisfier when these kind of products are bought. And then we have sustainability, sustainable brands at the top, which have a commitment that goes even beyond their own product offering. And for shoppers, sustainability for these products really is the major incentive to buy the products. And what is really striking here is that we see that both these types of brands have really, really outgrown uh, the market here uh, at more than double rates. And more interestingly, even, they have been able to do so with less promotional pressure than the year before, but also with less revenue share that actually comes from promotions. Just to give an example, the sustainable brands only have 10% of promoted revenue share, whereas the product functional brands are up to 26%. So what lessons can we really derive here? Well, first and foremost, it's to keep in mind that purpose really is a social cultural value. It's quite uh, independent from any social economic developments. And we should keep in mind that it's nowadays really glamorous to be green. So that means that also shoppers are willing to engineer their budgets accordingly, and they're really willing to pay full price or, or even a premium if products really cater to these values that the shoppers want to see reflected. And communication style, it's really all about enrichment rather than a restraint. It's no longer implies trade-offs or sacrificing quality or anything else. It's really about tapping into a positive sentiment. And secondly, as eco or social consciousness keeps rising, so will product offering. Uh, but we also have seen that 
common scrutiny of brand impact and the need for, for transparency and accountability is really rising. So there's a true need for trusted benchmarking here, uh, but also to really include it in category management uh, process to really make sure that we facilitate shopper choices uh, in their quest for purposeful purchasing. And last but certainly not least, we talked about this huge trust gap. And here it is really all about making the results visible and making them personal as well. So surely this starts by offering the right solutions where shoppers really feel they can make the biggest difference themselves. But it's more about uniting in the results and really showing how each and every single purchasing decision or related action is contributing to this common goal. So for the past 45 minutes or so, we've talked quite extensively about these five driving forces for change. And we would definitely love to keep talking about them for hours because there's so much to say. But we hope to at least have been able to show you even a small bit of foresight into what to expect and how to anticipate upon these changes in the coming years. And for sure, we are really here to help you seize the change with our insights along the behavior change loop. So we'd also really kindly like to invite you to uh, go to our behavior change uh, web area, which the link will be provided in the deck that we will share with you, uh, where you can find lots more insights on the respective topics that we have uh, dealt with today. And also keep an eye out for some of our initiatives that will be out that are really uh, deepening our insights on several topics, such as the future of meat studies that will run in a few countries, or our third edition of Who Cares Who Does that will uh, come to you over the course of summer. And now just before we would go to a Q&A, we would have a final poll because we're really interested to understand what forces of change you think will impact your business the most, and you can select uh, up to three options if you want. So I'll give you a little bit of time to think. Okay, I think we can see some results now probably. Well, just let me <laughs> have it sit in a bit. So we see most answers going to purpose and budgetering at the same end. So I think it's quite interesting that most of you actually also feel this increasing tension between wanting to really find products that, that have a meaning and an added value for you. And at the same time also, make that all fit within your, your budget. And in third place, we see findability reflected. And quite surprised that in midst of a health crisis, um, balance is not one of the topics that comes out on top uh, here either. So um, yeah, thanks. Really, really good to know how you all think about this. And I think we have time for some questions. Yes, Lenneke, there were a lot of questions, which is really nice. Thank you all for sharing your, your questions. Um, maybe there were a few questions concerning the, the channels and what kind of channels will be or have been affected in what kind of way during the COVID cri uh, crisis and who will be the winners in 2021 and 2022. So maybe I uh, can answer those questions or not by now, sure. but I can tell you what we want to do. Uh, so uh, we made uh, already last year an evaluation on the winners and the losers, let's say uh, from a channel perspective um, after the panic phase. So we published it uh, last year in August. Um, and of course we saw that it was, um, uh, it was a bit depending on um, 
the ability of products in the shelves uh, at specific retailers. It was um, also a question of Western European versus Eastern European countries. So it's not that easy to answer this question. Uh, if you want to reread it, uh, we can send out this um, old uh, document we have made last year, but we will also uh, try to ev evaluate it uh, this year again, because we saw in the different phases of the crisis, there were different winners. Um, and therefore we will make a new report, uh, hopefully published in August, um, about the channel choice and how it was uh, driven by uh, the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, just top line, we saw that those, um, uh, those retailers were um, gaining uh, shoppers and value who had um, a complete assortment and were quite local retailers, let's say. On the other hand, we saw that uh, those who have a very small assortment, a specialized assortment, had some problems in the beginning. But of course, now with the, the, the big topic of budgeteering, it might occur that um, at, that hard discount are coming up again, especially uh, in Eastern European countries where more people were affected. Uh, but please give us a bit of time to, to figure it out uh, very well so that we can answer it uh, with our evaluation on general choice and budgeteering in August, I think, Lenica, right? Yes, correct. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Thanks for answering, Mark, and hopefully this uh, answers your question as well. Um, I see some different questions Can coming I... through on uh, the, the use of new technology in the topic of findability. Um, and I found this one really interesting. Uh, the, the use of new technology is mainly defined here as, for example, use of self-scan throughout uh, the store. So it's also like in-store technology. And what we saw, whereas before, these behaviors were limited to only a few countries in Europe. Uh, in the crisis, much more people really uh, opened up to the use of these kind of, uh, let's say, shopping assistants. Um, obviously having to do with, by using this kind of technology, you don't have to interact with many people. You can just keep your shopping trip much more to yourself. But uh, me, for example, I am based in the Netherlands and here like self-scan shopping has been going on for quite a few years already. It has had major effects on routing in store uh, and on certain categories, simply uh, losing out lots of revenue. Just think of all, all these impulse categories that usually are at the cash register where you have interaction and you wait in the line. And suddenly this whole environment is changed because you just only need to pay and you're out because you've already scanned all your products. So uh, I found it, uh, for me, it was one of the most surprising findings, I think, in the area of, of findability that so many people intend to increase the use of new technology and seem to have really embraced this. This especially holds true in countries like Italy, where the, the crisis has been really harsh. So um, really, really key to rethink as well how this will affect uh, how people shop in store. Maybe I can answer another question. It was about regional and local products. So what do um, shoppers think is local or regional? Um, maybe I can answer this from a German perspective uh, because we made a multi-client study on um, regional products in Germany. And at least for Germans, um, local regional really means in the city, in the same city, in the same area and not thinking as uh, regional like German products. Um, and we saw that uh, especially for categories which are produced, agriculturally produced, this is true, especially true. So people think really about um, uh, the farmers nearby and not about farmers, uh, for example, uh, in another different area in Germany. Uh, maybe this is a bit different in uh, Eastern European countries where this topic of national products is very, uh, a very hot topic at the moment. But maybe even for those, they even think about their, their local 
people around them so that they um, still have jobs and uh, still can produce whatever they want. So therefore, I think it's also true for other countries that they more think in uh, in regions than in the full country. For example, this is true for, for the Polish market, uh, where really some products are regional products and not used in the whole country. So thanks, Mark. And looking at the time, I think we uh, our time is up, unfortunately. Um, any other outstanding questions, we will make sure we will get back to you um, either via mail or in any other form we can uh, can reach you, of course. Um, so yes, the download will be available uh, afterwards. You will get sent a link as well as the, the slide deck. Um, and for now, uh, we would surely, uh, on behalf of Mark and Miriam, like to thank you very much uh, for joining in and we hope you found it useful and you enjoyed it. Um, and if you have any questions on um, the, the, the more localized uh, insights on behavior change, please be sure to reach out to your local context that will be included in your uh, deck as well. So thank you very much and um, stay healthy and safe. Thank you, Lenica, Mark and Miriam, and Hi. thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. Once you leave the webinar, you'll receive a survey on the presentation and we'd appreciate it if you could complete that and provide your feedback. You'll also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view the recording of today's webinar and a copy of the presentation will be made available. On behalf of GFK and our presenters, thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day.